Hello and welcome to Devil's Advocate. Does the government appreciate the enormity of the challenge India faces as a result of the international economic crisis? That's the key issue I shall explore today with the Minister of Commerce and Industry, Kamal Nath. Minister, many people believe that the RBI was slow in cutting the CLR, the SRR, the repo rates. People feel they should have all been cut a week earlier. Would you agree? Well, the whole thing started three weeks ago. And within a span of 10 days, government acted. You can't act in a panic. You can't have a knee-jerk reaction. You have to consider all aspects of it. And the government has acted. The Reserve Bank has acted. Let me point this out. When he presented his credit policy, the RBI governor said that he was as concerned about financial stability as he was about price stability. In fact, in his statement, he even spoke of the possibility of tightening liquidity if the need arose. But exactly a week earlier, the deputy chairman of the planning commission had gone on record to say that inflation was no longer the primary threat. His exact words were, the back of inflation is actually broken. So wasn't the government speaking in two voices? Not at all. We had inflation which went up to 13%. It was coming down the curve, had stopped uh, rising. The rise in price rise had stopped. Now, of course, government itself had contained liquidity about six months ago because of inflation. Now, there's got to be a calibrating. There has to be a calibring between the money in the market uh, and inflation. That's what we were doing. In which case, if there has to be a calibration, do you think he, the governor, has cut the CRR rate and the interest rate sufficiently? After all, you know better than I do that Asocham is calling for a 3% cut in interest rates. Fiki thinks that the CRR rate should be at 3, maximum 3.5%. So has he done enough? There's a balance. You see, there is a liquidity issue. First, the liquidity issue was targeted by us, by government because of inflation. We got it double-barreled. Then came the international crisis. Then came a lack of consumer confidence and lack of investor confidence. Then came the pulling out of FII's of about $12 billion from our stock markets. So all these things came double-barreled. Uh, there has to be a balance between how much fat you'll put in the frying pan. And that fat is the liquidity. But the point is that in making that balance, and I concede it's a difficult balance for anyone to achieve, has the governor erred too much on the side of caution? The industry was hoping for a big bang set of policies. What the government offered was a drip, drip, drip of small measures. As a result, the need for a psychological push to cut through fear, to cut through panic, seems to have been ignored. Well, the Prime Minister had a meeting with industry. But that was just now. That was just now. Two days ago. This whole crisis is a three-four three, week crisis. It's not that it's three months. Now, you really require uh, action which is not panic. You know, we don't have the problems which are there in the Western world. We must remember that with our strong fundamentals, with our banks not being in trouble, there is an element of caution to be exercised. While exercising the caution, I think the injection of liquidity into the system has taken place. Except for the fact that people feel it should have happened earlier, you're saying to me that that sort of criticism made by many industrialists, made by sections of the press against the governor, that criticism is unfair, perhaps it's even unfounded. It's not unfair or unfounded. Everybody has to have a view. Somebody who's got a liquidity crisis wants it all. Now, he's not concerned with any other dimension of it. The government and the Reserve Bank is concerned with all dimensions and all facets of the problem. The papers reported that you felt the governor should have gone faster, he should have cut deeper. Were the papers correct in reflecting your views? Well, I, I did say that we should do this immediately. And immediately it happened in five days instead of three. Now, what difference does it make? It's not that it happened after five months or it happened after five weeks. So too much is being made about the difference too of much is two, being, three days. Too much is being made of it. And now with the injection of liquidity into the system, into the financial system, there is a lot of ease. But there are new issues to be grappled with. Absolutely. And that's what I want to come to. Let's begin by talking about the fear of layoffs. The Prime Minister, in fact, in his meeting with industry, in his address to the country, has appealed to industry to avoid layoffs. But you know, as industry minister better than most, the fear of layoffs is is not only present, in some sectors it's growing. Industry has already begun to cut bonuses, it's begun to cut salaries, perquisites are being cut. Can layoffs really be avoided? I think layoffs can be avoided. We must remember our economy is domestic demand driven. There is an element of export which adds to our GDP. We have exports of 170, 80 million dollars or 170, 80 billion dollars which we'll have this year. Now what's happening in the United States where there's no liquidity, there's no consumer confidence, there's no buying, the economy is going down, Sa same in Europe. It's going to affect our exports. So Indian industry, I believe, has the resilience to overcome this. Well, the question is how much resilience does it have? Let's first take the issue of exports, let's come to domestic demand related issues thereafter. There are fears 
that export growth this year could collapse to just 10% compared to 27% the year before. Now, in the case of the small and medium enterprises, which are the backbone of India's export industry, surely there, there will be enormous pressure to make layoffs. Otherwise, those companies could become unviable very quickly. Well, they've been, the small and medium sector has been helped by the appreciation of the dollar and the depreciation of the rupee. So that is one uh, benefit they've got. We are looking at other benefits where we can give them uh, some, um, some swaps. Except the recession in the West seems to outweigh Absolutely. any uh, benefit in terms of the rupee and the dollar. The, the recession in the West is a demand, will, uh, will create a demand constriction. That Which is, is why Indian exports will suffer and therefore in export related industries, can you really be certain you won't see layoffs? I believe we won't because I think the Indian market is growing. Believe I think or I, hope? I, I, believe or hope? I believe and I hope. Why? There are new markets. There are new markets to tap where we will find space. So there will be a marginal effect. I, I mean, I'm not saying there won't be a marginal effect. There will be a marginal So there will be some layoffs? Not layoffs. There will be a marginal effect on exports. Okay. Let's then look at the domestic demand impetus into the Indian economy. The Business Standard reported just two days ago that out of the 1,379 companies that have so far reported their second quarter results, net profits have dropped by as much as 35%. This is the sharpest drop since 98 when reporting quarterly results became mandatory. Surely such companies to remain viable are going to have to start laying off people. Otherwise the companies themselves will go to the wall. Well, this is profits. We must recognize the last four years companies have made 50-60% profits. In the West, and in the other parts of the world, they are struggling with 5-10% profits. So if their profits are coming to 30%, Indian industry must live with this 30% profits. You cannot have those huge profits forever. So you're saying to industry captains, don't try and boost your profits by cutting people at this moment. Live with smaller profits, but retain the people you have. Absolutely. And I'm saying that, and I'm saying that if you're going to have 30% profit, those are very good profits internationally. Except that and, this goes and, against and, the grain of economic logic. This it? is transitory. I don't believe that this gloom which is set in the West is permanent. It's transitory. Let's face it. Let's address it and move on. So you're saying for the greater good of India and its unity, accept lower profits, don't try and boost them by laying people off. For greater good of industry and for greater good of the company itself. Because this is transitory, as I said. What happens when a captain of industry turns around and say, says to you, this doesn't make economic sense. My business is to boost profits. I'm not in the business of social engineering. I think it makes a lot of economic sense when you have a 30% profit. And internationally, you compare it with any profits. The profits by, made by Indian companies are the highest in the world. All right. Traditionally in India, services, which accounts for just over 50% of GDP growth, has always lifted the performance of the Indian economy. But this year, when financial services and construction are actually in the doldrums, and a whole host of other services, such as tourism, transport, travel, advertising, marketing, hotels, even the media are in serious trouble. Can services really lift the performance of the country? In fact, can services come in in double digits? Well, I think services will continue its, to have its role in our GDP. Services will have its role in our growth. But can they achieve double digit growth? Yes, they will achieve. They are achieving it. There has been no slowdown because patterns are changing. Now, in the Western world, in the IT sector, they need global competitiveness. For them, it's because of their problems. It's even more important for them to become competitive. But because of and their problems, Wipro, Emphasis, Satyam, all of them could begin to suffer. They could find contracts be cancelled. They may be under pressure themselves to have to therefore contract and lay off people. I don't think so. What, what could perhaps happen is, and what they have said, is that the number of jobs we were creating, maybe we're not going to be creating those same numbers. So growth in jobs may be yeah, checked. Yeah, growth in employment generation will be affected. But you're saying actual levels of employment that exist shouldn't be affected. Will not be affected. Regardless of whether we are talking about exports, manufacturing or services. We must remember the curve which we were on was very sharp. Now the curve will not be that sharp. That's the only difference. It's not that we're going to start going down. Let me put this to you. This crisis happens at a time and it coincides, sadly, with Christian killings in Orissa, with the MNS threat in Maharashtra. It coincides with Singhur, with the uncertainty of elections, with continuing terror. Are you worried that all of this together could put investors off India? I don't think so. Last month, our, uh, uh, in, in September, our inflows of FDI have been 250% more than, the, than September. But is this going to continue? 
Well, there is a liquidity crisis abroad, but I believe that a huge liquidity crisis. With the liquidity crisis, there will need to be still investments made for manufacturing, investments to be made, and they will look at India for that. So you're saying that commitments in terms of FDI already made will be honored, they won't be postponed, they no. won't be delayed? I don't see that. It's reflected in the figures as of September. And this year, but can that continue into October, in the, November, December? In and the next first six months, our FDI inflows have been 135% more than the six months of the previous year. But what about the next six months? We're worried about the next six months and the six months after that. Will that rate of growth continue? Will it fall? Will it actually become negative? It will not become negative. In September, but it's 230% it, more. But could the rate of growth diminish? Well, we won't see this 200% growth all the time. Let's be clear. Uh, it's because of the liquidity crisis, there is bound to be some impact. But I believe that the FDI target of 34, 35 billion, which we've set for this year, will be met. Let me tell you why I put this question so forcefully to you. Already two major British papers, The Telegraph and The Times, have started publishing articles which are questioning India's rate of growth. They're even questioning the fundamentals of the Indian economy. The Economist, a very influential magazine, did that just a couple of weeks earlier. Is there a sense in which the sheen is coming off the India story? It's not the India story. The sheen is of the Western world. And that sheen, uh, which is of the Western world, is causing a sentiment effect, a frenzy effect in India. But you're saying they're not seeing us in different lights? They're in not seeing relative, us through different spectacles? No. We're in a relative situation, we are so much better off. Okay. In which case, how confident are you that you can still achieve 7.5 or at least 7% growth? Or is that a slight overstatement? No, I don't think it's an uh, overstatement at all. We are on track to achieve 7.5 and excess of 7.5 this year. Politicians usually say that when questioned. Do you really mean it or are you simply saying it because you need to boost morale and speaking the truth is too difficult? No, it's not. It's reflected in figures. So you're nailing your colors to 7.5% growth this year? Absolutely, absolutely. All right, let's take a break. I want to come back and talk a little bit more specifically about the government's response in certain specific areas to this crisis. That's in a moment's time. See you after the break. Welcome back to Devil's Advocate and an interview with the Minister of Commerce and Industry, Kamal Nath. Minister, let's turn to the government's response in certain specific areas. The Prime Minister has said that the government intends to pump prime the economy and many people agree with him. But the truth is that if you look at the large government projects that could actually do the pump priming, I'm talking about the National Highways Development Project, I'm talking about privatization of airports, I'm talking about power projects, they're not just languishing, they're actually behind schedule by months if not years. Now in the absence of these projects, isn't pump priming just well-intentioned rhetoric and nothing more? Not at all. We, this has come now. We have now decided to pump in so much more. Uh, and that's going to happen. If, so you we say, accept if, we say, if we say everything has been languishing, that's not correct. Let's be clear. If we see what's happening in our highways, we built more highways for, than what have been ever built Tell me something. on a daily basis. You, you said something very interesting. This has come now. The government has decided to pump money into these projects. Do you have any idea of how much you intend to pump in? Well, we'll, we will definitely have to pump in, in uh, close to 1,000 crores on an annual basis in definitive projects. In the power sector, 1,000 crores. In roads, 1,000 crores. Totally, I think we would need to pump in 20,000, 25,000 crores uh, in the next six months to keep this oil, to keep the machine moving. Where is this money going to come from? 25,000 crores in six months is a huge sum of money. Where is it coming from? Well, it has got to be relocated, reallocated between existing government revenues. And we are very conscious. So we what are you very, going to We plan? are very conscious of printing notes. We are very conscious of financial management. Let's be very clear so on you, that. So you're saying so to me there will be no printing within, of notes? Within the confines of financial, good financial management. In other words, you're not going to print new money. You're going to do it within the budget Absolutely. allocations. So then what are you going to cut to give yourselves the 25,000 crores? Greater efficiencies. And this the finance minister will have to look at. That how, do, from where does he trim? How does he create this? What creates employment? What creates uh, more economic activity? The problem with trying to fund this money, and it's a fortune of 25,000 crores from greater efficiencies, is that historically the Indian government has not been capable of producing greater efficiencies. Not just you, all governments in India are actually inefficient. So where will this efficiency come from? 
Well, there has been a transformation in the last couple of years. Let's remember public-private partnerships we were new to. There were many platforms we did not have. And now that we got these platforms, I think it's become easier. You're absolutely confident that your fiscal deficit is not going to go through the roof as a result? Well, I don't believe so. We, this is the finance minister. Don't has to, believe so. Doesn't sound like confident. I'm absolutely confident. I'm absolutely confident. I believe the finance minister is going to ensure this. So you're already saying to me, and I'm repeating it because it's such an important thing, that there will be no printing of money, the fiscal deficit won't suffer. This 25,000 crore will literally come from greater efficiencies. Absolutely. And reallocations. All right. That is going to be something that time alone will prove. Let's come to another suggestion made this time by N.K. Singh in the Times of India. He says that the government should dip into India's reserves and create a special fund of $30 billion, which could be used for financial institutions as the first option of redemption. And many other people who support this idea say that it would mitigate the flight of capital out of the country, it would stabilize the stock market and the rupee, and in due course when things improve, it would also make a tidy profit for the government. Do you think this is a wise suggestion? It's one of the suggestions and it has its pros and cons. I believe that we should not try and fight this capital which is gone. We must try and attract it back. And I see it coming back. It's, this is a panic. Why is the capital gone back? Not because India's fundamentals were bad, not that they were making profits. It's a tribute that the most easily incashable uh, stocks you, were Indian stock market. But if you want to actually attract capital back and attract fresh capital in larger measure, then what steps are you doing, for instance, to make it easier for NRIs to bring more and more money in? We, 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 are looking, we are looking at various steps in that direction. Such as? We are looking at how it can be more attractive for them. We, this cannot be demanded. Would you remove ceilings, for instance? We are looking at it, and I don't want to say what's happening. But what I want to say is that we are looking at greater capital inflows. We are looking at greater f dollar inflows. Would you allow banks to offer higher rates of interest to NRI deposits? That's one way of doing it. Well, this is something which is being looked at, and uh, I, I think we should leave it at that. Because so, so you have an open mind? Of course there is. On all mind. these? This, it's, it's one of our options. So you have an open mind on steps to attract greater to capital. You also have an open mind on N.K. Singh's suggestion of setting up a $30 billion well, or $40 well, you know, billion that is, fund. That suggestion is not a new suggestion. It's come many times of what we should do with our foreign But it's very reserves. timely we, at the moment. Let's be clear. We have been very cautious and very conservative with our reserves. Okay. We should continue to be cautious. Uh, with our reserves, we must but, but, not. But at 258 billion, you do have the reserves to fund a 30 billion yes, venture. Yes, yes, Karan. That's one of the things. It seems very big, but then if you look at it in the context of GDP, if you look at it in the context of our our deficit at the moment, our trade deficit at the moment, uh, it's not a very. What's large the reserve. level below which you don't want your reserves to fall? They've already reached 258 billion. What? is the level you would feel comfortable that they mustn't fall I below. think 258 billion is also less. We should have not let it go below 300 billion because when we look at our trade deficit, our fiscal foreign fiscal deficit, uh, we need to be cautious on these things. So you're already a little worried about the deficit, well, we, uh, the reserves? We are cautious. We are very cautious on our reserves and we want to treat them with kids' gloves. My last question. We've been talking so far about the economic handling. Many people point towards the psychological handling of the crisis. I want to quote to you briefly the business standard. It says, the system needs something more than the finance minister declaring that the fundamentals are sound, that investors must not panic, that banks must lend. The question is, is your government capable of that something more? Of course, we are doing it. We have done it in the last three weeks, and we'll continue to do it. And the prime minister has set up a committee to act as a rapid action uh, set up to address these issues immediately. Many people feel that the finance minister is too cut and dried, too technical, sometimes even too cold in his response. Can you understand that comment or do you completely disagree with it? Well, a finance minister's role of, in a finance minister's job is a finance minister's job. And uh, in that, some may consider him to be too, uh, too tight on many things. Well, that's their view. But a finance minister's job has to be to be tight. All right, Kamalath, a pleasure talking to you on Devil's Advocate.